The following content is provided by MIT OpenCourseWare under a Creative Commons license. Additional information about our license and MIT OpenCourseWare in general is available at ocw.mit.edu. Talking about molecular orbital theory. And um, remember what the key idea was there. The key idea was to take the wave functions, the atomic wave functions, the wave functions on the atoms that are going to form this chemical bond, take those wave functions and let them overlap. Let them constructively and destructively interfere. Hey, after all, they're waves, they're wave functions. They can constructively and destructively interfere. And we saw last time that when these atomic wave functions constructively interfered, the result was a molecular wave function that was a bonding func wave function, consequently had a bonding state. So for example, in the case of oxygen, we have the two S wave functions on each of the isolated oxygen atoms. When they overlap, they can constructively interfere to form a sigma 2S bonding wave function and consequently a sigma 2S bonding state. And there are two electrons in that. And you'll remember that we labeled the molecular states with respect to the symmetry of the wave function around the molecular axis. That wave function was sigma if that symmetry was cylindrical around the molecular axis. It was pi, here in this case, for molecular oxygen, when the wave function was not cylindrically symmetric around the bond axis. And we also saw what happened when these two wave functions come together. They overlap and they destructively interfere. When they destructively interfere, we form what we call the antibonding wave function. We gave it a designation star. In the case here of the 2S uh, electrons or wave functions in oxygen, this formed the sigma 2S star wave function, the antibonding wave function. Its energy is higher than that of the atomic states for the two separated oxygen atoms. The bonding state is lower in energy, the antibonding state is higher in energy. And um, so this was for the 2s electrons. Below this, right, lower energy, because they're most strongly bound, are the 1s atomic states and the molecular states formed by the uh, constructive and destructive interference of the 1s wave functions. I didn't draw that. 2s then is higher in energy. And finally, here, here are the 2p states that are coming together in molecular oxygen, forming a sigma 2pz and then 2 uh, molecular states, uh, pi 2py and a pi 2px. And then in molecular oxygen, we also saw that there was one electron each here in the uh, pi star 2px and pi star 2py. Okay. Okay, now I just wanted to say a few words here about the physical significance of these energies here. So this is the molecular orbital in the case of molecular oxygen here. This is the molecular state that is highest occupied, right? What we mean by highest occupied is that it is the state that is the highest lying in energy. It has an electron in it that's the highest lying in energy. What this binding energy means is, or what this energy means is that if I put in energy to pull this electron, the one that's highest lying in energy, off, right? The energy from here to O2, O2 plus, plus an electron, right? This physically 
is the ionization energy of O2, right? Because the first ionization energy is always the energy required to take off the most weakly bound electron, or, or the electron in the most highest lying energy state. So that's the ionization energy of O2. That turns out to be about 12.01 electron volts. That's what that physically means. In contrast here, if I were to pull an electron off of an oxygen atom, these are the oxygen atom states, right? Pull an electron off of the oxygen atom, so I have O plus plus an electron. Well, this is the ionization energy of oxygen. This is a little bit larger than it is for molecular O2. This is 13.58 eV, okay? And you can see that here. These two P states are lower lying in energy than the pi states in the molecular oxygen. This isn't in your notes, okay? And likewise, if I were to look at the, uh, if I were to look at the electron affinity of oxygen, right? And now I'm just going to draw here the pi star 2px, pi star 2py, and uh, here's my atomic states, here are the other two pi's, here's the sigma, here's oxygen, okay? If I were to look at the uh, electron affinity of oxygen, molecular oxygen, so way up here, I have an O2 molecule, right, plus an electron. Right? Putting an electron in, I would have to put it in that state. And so the energy difference here from here to here is minus the electron affinity which is, in the case of molecular oxygen, minus 0 0.045 eV, okay? So I just wanted to give you a feeling for what these energies actually mean. We don't, we're not plotting them as a function of energy here, but they physically mean something, right? In terms of, for example, the ionization energy of molecular oxygen or the ionization energy of uh, atomic oxygen. All right, you can see the, love, the relative orders of the energies of all of these different states. All right? Okay, this kind of diagram that we've been drawing here is called, sometimes it's called a molecular orbital energy diagram, sometimes it's called a correlation diagram. It's called a correlation diagram because it shows you, by the means of these kind of dotted lines here, it shows you how the atomic states correlate to the molecular states. That's why it's, it's called a correlation diagram again. It shows you how those atomic states correlate to the molecular states. Okay? Questions? Okay. If not, then I want to proceed. Uh, there was one page on the lecture last time that I hadn't finished, so I want to uh, talk about that right now. And um, that was drawing the molecular orbital diagram, or the correlation diagram, for um, a heteronuclear diatomic molecule, and that's CO. All right, in the case of the heteronuclear diatomic molecule, we proceed in the same way as we do for a homonuclear diatomic molecule. That is, we have the states of the individual atoms out here, and now I'm just showing you the 2P states. 2S are down here, 1S is down here, lower in energy, but I haven't drawn it all. And what you also see is that the 2p states on the oxygen atom here are lower in energy than the 2p states on the carbon. Hey, and that's right. Remember, we talked about the fact that as the nuclear charge gets larger, those atomic states are more strongly bound because the Coulomb interaction is greater. 
So the atomic states of oxygen are lower in energy than those of carbon. If you were to ask to draw this on a homework problem or on an exam, you would have to show that the oxygen atomic states are lower in energy than those for carbon. Okay. okay. But we proceed much in the same way. That is, the two PZ states here overlap. Remember, those are the states that, by definition, we th are putting parallel or along the bond axis, right? So they overlap to form the sigma 2PZ wave function for the molecule. And then the 2 pi x and 2 pi y are overlapping to form, those are the ones coming in like this, right? Parallel to each other. Those are the, they form the pi 2px and pi 2py. And likewise, um, you have the antibonding states. These wave functions can destructively interfere, resulting in the antibonding pi star 2 pi x, pi star 2 pi y, and sigma star 2 pi z. All right, so now we got all the states there, and now we proceed using the Aufbau principle. We start populating them, lowest energy first, until we use up all the electrons. So we got six electrons. So we put uh, two of them in that lowest energy state, and then the other four here in this, these pi uh, states. And that then is the uh, correlation diagram, or just the top part of it, for this molecule CO. And if I had to write the electron configuration, here it is. Here's the sigma 1s2, sigma 1s star 2, and sigma 2s star, or sigma 2s2, sigma star 2s2, sigma 2pz2, pi 2px2, and pi 2py2. Now, what's the bond order? Remember, that was a um, that was a measure here of the strength of the bond. Right? The bond order is the number is one half times the number of uh, bonding electrons minus antibonding electrons. Well, in this case, it's three, right? Because we have two, four, six, eight, ten bonding electrons. We have two, four. Antibonding electrons, 10 minus 4 is 6, divided by 2 is 3. This is a triple bond. And the bonding energy here, the binding energy, is 1,062 kilojoules. Hey, this is the strongest bond known, the bond, this triple bond here between carbon and the oxygen. Yes? Most negative, right. No, with the lowest energy is always the more negative, okay? Yeah, great. There's one other thing I want to point out here. Remember I talked about the relative ordering of sigma and pi? How in the case when z equal 8, the sigma level drops below the pi level? Well, that's true, but here we got CO where one of the atoms has z equal 8 and one of them is less than z equal 8. What do we do in that case? In that case, we're going to put the sigma lower than the pi. We're going to follow the z equal 8 or greater rule, okay, when you have a choice there. Okay, so that's the uh, heteronuclear diatomic molecule. All right, now what we're going to do is we're going to leave molecular orbital theory. We're going to start talking about larger molecules than diatomic molecules. And um, we've got another approach for um, these larger molecules, and that's what's called the valence bond method, um, along with a hybridization and I'll explain that to you. You can use the molecular orbital approach for larger molecules, right? We're not going to do that. It doesn't always work, okay, for larger molecules. Let me show you just an example here of 
when it doesn't work. And that's in the case of uh, methane. So here I've just drawn a carbon atom. And um, I show you the 2px and the 2pz uh, wave functions for a carbon. And in the molecular orbital approach, what did we do? Well, what we did is that we let one atom, the wave function from one atom, overlap with the wave function from the other to form a new molecular uh, wave function. And so that's what we would do if we started with a molecular orbital approach for methane. We'd let the 1s wave function overlap with the 2pz on the carbon, and over here, the 1s wave function overlap with the 2px uh, wave function on the carbon. But if we did that, we're now stuck, right? We're stuck because we don't have another electron up here to overlap. We don't have another wave function to overlap with the hydrogen, right? The electron configuration of carbon is 2s, two electrons in it, and then one in one of the 2p wave orbitals, the other one in the other 2p uh, state, right? So if you use this molecular orbital approach strictly on methane, well, what it would predict is that we could only make two bonds to carbon, and it would say, well, methane is really CH2, and the bond angle here is 90 degrees. So molecular orbital theory, at least on methane, doesn't work, all right? Although it does work for some other polyatomic molecules. So that was just an example here of how it doesn't work. And so now we're going to tr take an approach that will work to describe the chemical bonding in methane, all right? And that's this hybridization coupled with uh, what we call the valence bond approach. Okay, so here, here's the important part. Here is the uh, atomic states for carbon. Notice two 2s two electrons and then one in each of the 2p states. The first thing that we're going to do is we're going to do an electron promotion. We're going to take this electron and put it up there, all right? That's electron promotion. Hey, that costs energy. Where did the energy come from? I'm going to tell you soon where the energy comes from. We're just going to do it now. And then we'll go back and look at where the energy comes from. All right. What we're then going to do is uh, draw out here each one of these uh, atomic wave functions. So I'm drawing this atomic wave function, this one, this one, and this one on the next slide. That's what this is. Here's the 2s. Hey, that's spherical. Here's the 2pz we looked at before. Here's the 2ps. Here's the 2py. Those are the four atomic wave functions. Now what I'm going to do, and this is all on carbon, haven't formed any bonds yet, but now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take these four wave functions, and they're all on the same carbon, right? But I'm going to let those four wave functions constructively and destructively interfere, all right? So now I'm taking the wave functions on the same atom and letting them constructively and destructively interfere. In molecular orbital theory, we took the wave functions on different atoms and let them constructively and destructively interfere. This is going to be taking the wave functions on the same atom and letting them constructively and destructively interfere. When I do this, what you're going to get is something that looks like this. You're going to get four different wave functions that we're going to call the sp3 wave functions or the sp3 orbitals. More precisely, they are the four sp3 hybrid wave functions or hybrid orbitals because they are 
this linear combination, this constructive, the overlap of these four different wave functions, all right, on the same carbon atom to make four equivalent wave functions, hybrid wave functions that we call sp3 wave functions. They all look the same. They're just oriented in space a little differently. To understand that, and it's not clear, I know, from looking at this, how that gets like this. But here's one simple way to look at one of these, all right? Take this 2s wave function and let it constructively and destructively interfere with the 2pz wave function. So this sphere is essentially on top of here. What you notice on the 2pz wave function is that this part of the wave function has got a positive amplitude. Remember we talked about the positive sign on one of these lobes, meaning it had a positive amplitude. And this part of the wave function, hey, that's got a negative sign. It has a negative amplitude. But the 2s wave function here has a positive amplitude everywhere, all right? So if we put the 2s on top of here, well, you can see that right here, we're going to have two positives, amplitudes of two waves that are positive. They're going to constructively interfere. And the result is above here, right here, if you just take these two and look at this, you're going to have a lot of wave function right up there. However, below this plane where we have a positive wave function, at the same part where we have a negative wave function, well, you know what? This is destructive interference, and the result is that the wave function here is going to be pretty small. It's still going to be a little negative, but it's going to be pretty small. All right? So that's probably the simplest just example to look at so that you understand how I get from here to here. Okay? Okay. So we're going to form these four sp3 wave functions. Now, here's a picture of uh, that. When I take these four wave functions, which are all, I've just separated them out in space, but now I'm really just going to put them on top of each other because they really all have the same origin here. When I do that, my wave function kind of looks like this, where these lobes here are the positive parts. They're my sp3 wave function. And in this picture, I left out the little negative lobes that would be sticking out here. I left those out because it's just too hard to draw this. All right? And what I want you to, uh, what I want you to notice here is that this angle from here to here is 109.5 degrees. Okay. This is a little bit better picture that I didn't draw, right, of those sp3 wave functions. In this case, you can see the little bit of the negative wave function from this positive lobe over here, right? And you can kind of see the little negative here and the little negative there, right? That's a better picture than the one I drew. Okay, so we've got this, uh, this kind of configuration here with an angle of 109.5 from this lobe to that lobe, or this lobe to that lobe, or this lobe to that lobe. And you can understand that 109.5 degrees if I do the following. That is, if I now draw lines from the outermost point of each lobe, what you see is that I have a tetrahedron now with carbon in the center, right? And each one of these vertices here of this tetrahedron is at the outermost point of these wave functions. The angle in a tetrahedron, in a, in a uh, perfect tetrahedron, the angle is 109.5 degrees. That's where that 109.5 degrees comes from. It's a tetrahedral configuration around that carbon. 
Okay, so what did we do here? We took an electron, we promoted it. We then took these four wave functions and let them constructively and destructively interfere. The result now is four new wave functions corresponding to four new states. We're calling these states sp3 states. There's one electron in each one of those sp3 states. Where do these energies lie? Well, they lie in between the 2s and the 2p. So they're not as high in energy as the 2p, but they certainly are higher than the 2s. And overall, you can see we're still going to have to need some energy input into the system to make this happen. Okay? And I haven't told you yet where that energy comes from. Okay, so here we have this carbon, and we've just constructively and destructively let, or we, uh, we've just let those wave functions on the carbon itself destructively and constructively interfere. Now we're going to make bonds. Now we're going to take these hybrid wave functions and let them overlap with a wave function, an atomic wave function, function from another atom. Okay? Now we're going to start to make the bonds. So here goes. We're bringing in, a carb uh, bringing in a hydrogen, making a bond, bringing in a hydrogen, making a bond, bringing in a hydrogen, bringing in another hydrogen. Hey, now we've got methane. And what did we do to do this? What we did is we took that sp3 wave function on carbon and then brought in the hydrogen atom with its 1s wave function and we let it overlap. Now there is constructive interference right in here or destructive interference. And the result is now a new bond. A result is this constructive interference between this sp3 wave function and the 1s wave function. We're going to call that a sigma bond. It's sigma because that wave function is symmetric along the CH axis, right? It's cylindrically symmetric along the CH axis. So this is a new bond. That bond is a sigma bond composed of the carbon 2sp3 and the hydrogen 1s. Okay? And so we've got two electrons now in each one of those sp3 states. Okay. Now the question is, where did this energy come from for that hybridization? Remember, it, we had to promote an electron to do this, this trick here. So where did this come from? Well, where it comes from is from the bond formation. When you form a carbon-hydrogen bond, you're going to release some energy. It's lower energy. You're going to release some energy. And that energy for the hybridization comes from that bond formation. Okay? So in other words, when you make the CH bond, that's going to be an exothermic process. You're going to release energy. But because you have to do this electron promotion, the amount of energy you're going to release when you make that CH bond isn't all that you could have released if you didn't, didn't have to do this hybridization, if you didn't have to do this electron promotion. All right? So that energy to promote the electron comes from the actual CH bond formation. OK. Now, um, here's my methane, here's my carbon with just the uh, sp3 wave functions, right? I haven't gotten it bonded to anything in this picture. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to rotate this around, all right? And it'll be for a reason, all right? So I just rotated it around. And one electron in each one of the sp3 states. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring in another carbon 
sp3 hybridized carbon along this axis here that's why i turn this around so here comes the other sp3 hybridized carbon and i'm going to let these two sp3 hybrid wave functions overlap so that now one of my sp3 states has two electrons in it so here what am I doing right here? I'm letting those two sp3 wave functions overlap. Constructive interference. Hey, I'm going to make another bond, a sigma bond, because this wave function is cylindrically symmetric around that axis. That's a sigma bond. It is a sigma bond composed of the carbon 2 sp3 hybrid wave function and another carbon 2 sp3 hybrid wave function. Okay. I just formed a carbon-carbon bond. Hey, I just brought in some hydrogens. All right. In each one, in each case, I now have overlap between the 1s wave function and the sp3 wave function of the carbon and the molecule that I have is ethane. Let's look at and this angle here is 109 degrees, right? It's 109 degrees because you have that tetra tetrahedral configuration around the carbon because that's how the S, the 2S wave functions and the 3, 2P wave functions around the carbon constructively and destructively interfered to give you that tetrahedral shape for the sp3 wave functions let's take a oh okay i thought we we're going to do this more closely sorry all right so we made these these ch bonds here they're all sigma bonds also okay so that's carbon this sp3 hybridization for carbon but other atoms can also undergo this sp3 hybridization and one of those atoms here is nitrogen. Here's the electron configuration for uh, nitrogen. In this case, we've got a, uh, two electrons in the 2s state and then one in each one of the 2p states. What we're going to do here is we're going to allow now these three wave functions, four wave functions, to constructively and destructively interfere to what we call hybridize. All right. And the result will be, again, four sp3 wave functions. Except the difference is that because we have one more electron in nitrogen, one of these sp3 states has already got two electrons in it. All right, so it's not going to be available for bonding in a moment. Okay, so in nitrogen, the electron arrangement or the wave function arrangement is also tetrahedral, right? Sp3 to this corner, sp3, 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 except that one of these wave functions, these sp3 wave functions, really is kind of two sp3 wave functions there's two electrons here in this state this is the lone pair on the nitrogen and then sp3 hybridized nitrogen atom this is the lone pair pointed at one of these vertices but then each one of these lobes has just just represents one electron so they're going to be able available for bonding Okay, so what are we going to do here? We're going to bring in some hydrogens. Here's a hydrogen. Here's a hydrogen coming in. Here's a hydrogen. We've got ammonia. What did we do to form these nitrogen-hydrogen bonds? Well, we took that sp3 wave function on nitrogen and brought in the hydrogen, let that 1s wave function constructively, destructively interfere with that sp3 wave function. The result is a sigma bond. It's sigma, it's composed of the nitrogen 2sp3 and the hydrogen 1s wave function. Okay. Now, the angle right in here, right, the angle 
the hydrogen-nitrogen-hydrogen angle here. I want you to see that it's actually a little smaller than the ideal tetrahedral angle. It's no longer 109.5 degrees, it's 107 degrees. And the reason for that is because of this lone pair out here. This lone pair right, has a very repulsive interaction with the electrons in these nitrogen-hydrogen bonds here, bringing that angle in a little bit more close. This is, they're being repelled, all right? And so that will generally be the case. If you've got a lone pair of electrons somewhere, that will tend to repel, everything will be repelled from it. And the consequence is that this angle, this bond angle here is going to be a little smaller than a tetrahedral angle of 109.5 degrees. All right. Okay, but now here's a really important point. You're often asked for what is the geometry around some atom. In this case, you're asked for, you might be asked for, what is the geometry around nitrogen? When you're asked such a question, what that means is they're asking you what is the geometry of the atoms around the nitrogen, not the electrons, all right? The distinction is that the geometry of the electrons around this atom is about tetrahedral, but usually, one isn't interested in that. Usually, one's interested in what is the geometry of the other atoms around the nitrogen. And so in this case here, the geometry of the other atoms is a trigonal pyramidal geometry, right? It's not tetrahedral. So if you're asked for the shape of the nitrogen molecule, the answer is a trigonal pyramid, not a tetrahedron. That's really important. That trips up a lot of people, okay? So the lone pair is pointing out here, the electron geometry is approximately tetrahedral, but that's not what we're usually interested in. We're interested in where the atoms are, so the geometry is a trigonal pyramid. Okay, so that's the sp3 hybridization on, uh, on ammonia or on nitrogen. Oxygen, hey, oxygen can also undergo this sp3 hybridization. Here's the uh, electron configuration for an oxygen atom, two electrons in the 2s, two and four in the 2p states. What we're gonna do here again is we're going to let these Wave functions constructively, destructively interfere. When we do that again, we're going to get four new wave functions, the sp3 hybrid wave functions, but in the case of oxygen, because we have one more electron than that of nitrogen, we're gonna have two electrons in that sp3 state and two electrons in the other sp3 state, and then one electron each in the sp3 states. So what is the uh, electron arrangement around oxygen going to look like? Well, it's going to look like this, right? Where, again, each one of these sp3 wave functions is pointed to, is there a question over here that I can help somebody with? Okay. Each one of these wave functions is pointed to a corner of this tetrahedron. But again, one of these wave functions represents two electrons, this lone pair. Another one represents two electrons, that lone pair. And then only these two sp3 wave functions are going to be available for overlap with another atom. All right. So let's bring another atom in. Hydrogen is our atom of choice today. So we're we've just made the water molecule. What did we do? We took that sp3 wave function on oxygen and brought in a hydrogen. Overlapped them, we formed a sigma bond. 
a sigma bond between oxygen, 2sp3, and hydrogen, 1s. It's a sigma bond. Now, notice this angle here. It's 104.5 degrees. It's even smaller than 107 degrees. And 107 was smaller than the tetrahedral angle of 109.5. Why? Well, because we got these two lone pairs here of electrons. Hey, they're sticking out there. They really are repulsive to all the atoms around them. And so all the other atoms, these two hydrogens here, really try to get away from these two lone pairs. And so this angle here, the hydrogen-oxygen-hydrogen -hydrogen angle is even smaller than that in ammonia and much smaller than that in an ideal tetrahedron. It's 104.5 degrees. OK. Now, what's the if you were asked for the geometry of this molecule, what would you say? Sorry? Bent. All right, it's bent. It's also planar, right? If you got three atoms, hey, this is a no-brainer. If you got three atoms, the molecule's planar, right? The three points define a plane. And then the question is whether or not those three atoms are linear in a line or whether they're bent. And so in this case, for the water molecule, this is a bent planar arrangement. That's the atom arrangement. That's not the electron arrangement. The electron arrangement is approximately tetrahedral. But again, usually you're going to be asked for the atomic arrangement, the geometry around the oxygen. Hey, well, well this is a planar bent molecule with the two lone pairs sticking out here. And hey, you know what? I want you to remember these two lone pairs on water. Very important because I think Wednesday, we're going to talk about something called hydrogen bonding. And hydrogen bonding, these two lone pairs play a very critical role in hydrogen bonding. OK? OK. So we've just covered this sp3 hybridization. There are other ways in which the s wave functions and the P wave functions can constructively and destructively interfere. And to illustrate that, I'm going to start with this atom boron. All right, so one less electron than carbon. All right, so a different kind of hybridization now. In the case of boron, we're also going to have to do this electron promotion. So we just move that 2s electron up to a 2p state. So now we've got three wave functions, 2s, 2p, 2px, 2py, 2px, or, or three. Um, we've <laughs> got three populated states, OK? And we're going to let them hybridize. And when we let them hybridize, what we're going to get are three what we call sp2 wave functions, each with one electron. All right. Let me try to explain that. So these are the wave functions that we've got after this electron promotion. One wave function for that one electron in the 2s state on boron, it's spherically symmetric. One 2px. One electron represented by the 2py wave function. Here it is. Mm -hmm. What we're going to do now is to let these three wave functions, not four like in sp3 hybridization, but these three wave functions constructively and destructively interfere. And when we do that, we're going to get what we call sp2 wave functions, or sp2 hybrid wave functions or hybrid orbitals, OK? They all look the same, all right? They're just oriented differently. These three wave functions all lie in one plane, all right? 
The SP2 all lies in one plane, unlike SP3 hybrid wave functions. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take these three wave functions now, since they all have the same origin, I'm going to plot them on the same graph, right? And they're going to look like this. Again, I'm going to leave out this little negative lobe here, right? The little negative part of the wave function, just for clarity in this drawing. I just show you the positive part of the wave function. And these the positive parts, the maximum of the positive parts of those wave functions lie in one plane. And the angle between these wave functions is 120 degrees, each one of them. All right? So this is the sp2 hybridization on boron. One electron in each one of the sp2 states. I'm going to bring in a hydrogen now. Bring in another hydrogen. Bring in another hydrogen. Hey, I've got BH3. So what did, what did we do? Well, with each one of these hydrogens, we made a sigma bond. It's sigma because it's cylindrically symmetric around that axis. It is a sigma bond composed of boron 2sp2 overlapping with a hydrogen 1s bond. Okay. This molecule here is planar because these hybrid wave functions all lie in the same plane. Right? We call this trigonal planar because there's an angle of 120 degrees between each uh, hydrogen and boron hydrogen, or these hydrogen boron hydrogen angles are all 120 degrees. So it's trigonal planar. Okay? Okay, well, carbon, it can also undergo this sp2 hybridization. It can undergo sp3, but it can also undergo sp2. We have to do an electron promotion again. We did that. We're going to let them hybridize to sp2. The result is three sp2 wave functions, and one of the 2p wave functions is left alone. We're going to label it 2py. Okay, that one's not going to participate in this hybridization. So a picture is, here are the individual atomic wave functions on carbon. And I'm going to let just these three hybridize to make three sp2 hybrid orbitals, or three sp2 hybrid wave functions. And they have identically the same shapes as they did for boron. Okay? And then this guy hasn't been touched. It's still the atomic wave function, 2py. Yes? Why, why? because you've got different kinds of environments. Some environments allow these three wave functions to constructively and destructively fear. Others will allow all the four to constructively, destructively interfere. Thermodynamics, okay? Whether you are going to form here ethane or ethylene, okay, is a, is a function of a lot of other parameters. No, no, until we get to thermodynamics, and then you are, <laughs> okay? And the, but we'll get to that, okay? Okay, yeah, no, you're quite welcome. That's all right, because I know that this is a little bit abstract, but it actually the case, which one you're going to form, ethane or ethylene, all right, depends on what other constituents you've got around. It's going to depend on the relative pressures of, you know, your carbon and your hydrogen, okay? Okay. All right. So in, in this case here, I'm now going to, because we have the same origin, put these three wave functions on top of each other, plot them in the same graph. They're going to look like they did in the case of boron. I think we'll pick it up there on Wednesday. See you then.